Hello there. It's Thursday at noon. I know it is. Do you remember our arrangement? Thursdays at noon on CFUV. Are you ready to get started? What do you have in mind? What I want to do now is called first person plural. You make it sound excessively attractive. That's what I have in mind. Watch any number of talk shows on a regular basis and you will be treated to the makeover. The Learning Channel has entire shows dedicated to helping people find the right clothes, shoes, haircut, hair color, and makeup designed to present a quote, new you, close quote, to the world around you. Canadian-born sociologist Irving Goffman examined the ways in which we manage the impressions we make upon each other in his now classic book, The Presentation of Self in Everyday Life, first published in 1956. This work remains one of the most accessible sociological treatises available and still captures the imaginations of sociology students. I found when I was teaching that Goffman's ideas rang true to many students and when given an opportunity to write papers using a number of sources, the majority of the class would choose to use Goffman before any other sociologist. While Goffman did not directly address the ways in which the body is adorned in order to make an impression, he did touch upon the body as that part of the self which is engaged in creating an impression, in managing the reactions of others to one's self. Quote, the self, then, as a performed character, is not an organic thing that has a specific location whose fundamental fate is to be born, to mature, and to die. It is a dramatic effect, arising diffusely from a scene that is presented, and the characteristic issue, the crucial concern, is whether it will be credited or discredited. In analyzing the self, we are drawn from its possessor, from the person who will profit or lose most by it. For he and his body merely provide the peg on which something of collaborative manufacture will be hung for a time. The means for producing and maintaining cells do not reside inside the peg. In fact, these means are often bolted down in social establishments. There will be a back region with its tools for shaping the body and a front region with its fixed props. The self is a product of all these arrangements and in all of its parts bears the marks of this genesis." Close quote. One such social establishment that acts as a back region for many in their impression management is the hair salon. The old slogan, quote, only your hairdresser knows for sure, close quote, suggests the secret keeping region that Goffman describes in his book. We spoke with David, owner and operator of David Scissorhands, at 314 Cook Street here in Victoria, in the village, about hair, salons, and helping people create the impressions they want to make on others. To cut it short, we got sociological about hair. come in, when a customer comes in, do most people come in and just say, do the same thing you did before, or do they come in and want a new image? I mean, how do you know what to do to someone's hair when they walk in the door? Uh, well, the younger staff, of course, their, their customers are, have a higher turnover there. They've got a lot more new customers and things like that because they're building up their, their clients. And, uh, I'd say about about half tend to you know want something new each time, or you've never done them before. So even if it's the same thing, you don't know what it is. You have right. To, you have to figure out you know what it is they want, and uh, some people are a little bit vague. They they think they're being specific, but you got to figure out whether you're thinking of the same thing as they are. Uh, most of my customers, of course, I've been at it for a long time, so they're repeat customers. And I'd say about every third or fourth haircut, they ask for something different. And some people, they just, and you know. How do they ask for it different? Do they come in and say, you know, make me Elizabeth Taylor today? Something or else. do they come in and say, 
do they use other kinds of image words like some I need something professional or I need something slutty or yeah exactly yeah yeah so <laughs> some, some to everybody it, it changes a different thing somebody will say you know make it half inch shorter at the back and then that's a radical change because I haven't done that for two years and other people will come in and they've got you know a couple of pictures from magazines and they're they want something completely new but they're very specific about it and then other people will say you know what do you think you know or or do what you think and and you get to sort of go free reign and, and you know cut and color and so on as you like and how do you decide that i mean are you do you keep up with styles how do you know what's a good you do. I, I keep up with styles mostly just by keeping an eye out and things around me you know reading magazines and you know watching people when i'm out and things like that um like I say, a good portion of the customers, they, they know what they want. They've kept up the styles and they, they're fairly specific. Um, and others will ask you, they'll, they'll say, you know, our sideburns in right now or something, <laughs> which, which seems to sort of come and go, you know, almost within weeks. Of, you know, everybody will shave them off and then everybody will grow them back. Do you deal with facial hair? Do you ever do beards yeah. or uh, goatees, yeah. that yeah, kind of thing? Yeah, we do a fair number of, of male customers and we trim beards and stuff. For, in a lot of cases, guys will just find that they grow a beard, they don't like it. and a regular home razor won't take it off, so they'll come in and have it taken off with the clippers and then go home and clean it up themselves. How about shaved heads? Yeah. You've had a number of those in the last... Yeah, we get lots of lots of young guys that uh, they don't necessarily, if they're going to shave it, usually they shave it themselves, but they, they'll come in and have it cut, you know, an eighth of an inch long with the clippers or as yeah. short as we can go with the clippers. And that's pretty common. Yeah. And lots of guys just like to keep it that way, so they'll come in every two weeks and have it buzzed right down in the wood. Why do you think people care what their hair looks like? Why not just wash it, clean it, and it's done? There are lots of people like that, too. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have a lot of people that we just sell shampoo to. Um, I'm not really sure. I think it's just, you know, you, most people don't cover their head completely, so it's one of the few parts of you that's always exposed. You know, for the most part, scientists don't really know exactly why we have hair. Like, they, they've got lots of theories, but nobody knows exactly why, so... So I guess it's just it's something you can it's something that's part of your body that you can alter without any pain involved. <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> you, can't, you can't remove a finger or something like that; it's just to look different. You know, even tattoos. Yeah. You know, they sting a bit when you get them. But, uh, yeah, anybody who tells yeah. you they aren't painful. And, is and it always grows back, which means that it, uh, you know it can be changed continuously. You know, anything whether you like it or not. You know, in, in a couple of months you can change it. Yeah. And, uh, I remember I, when I was a kid, my sister had a, a Barbie that you could keep pulling the hair out, and she kept cutting it off until, you know, it wouldn't grow <laughs> hair anymore, but, but there was just sort of a fascination there with, you know, continually altering this, this the appearance of it, and I think that's part of it, it's just that you can't. And then, of course, you know, it's part of the sort of, become part of the fashion industry because of that, so it's like, you know, bell-bottom jeans or straight leg jeans, depends on what's in right now. How about politics? I mean, I remember, you know, the Broadway show Hair, and they used to talk about in the 60s and 70s, the politics of hair, yep. right, and well, wearing long hair. Do you find that some people come in wanting to make a political statement? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, kids in general, you, they don't want to look like their parents' generation, no matter what. <laughs> like, I'm from the generation where we all grew our hair long because our, our parents all had short hair. and and so on, and, and now it's sort of gone the other way, you know, lots of these parents are, are sort of hippie types and their kids are all shaving their heads, so, <laughs> so it's just sort of a, again, it's something, it's a sort of harmless rebellion, you know, you can, you can alter it without, <laughs> without really doing anything absolutely permanent, but you know it'll still bug your mom. Um, and do you think it's harmless? I mean, in the sense you said harmless rebellion, but do you think that people have gut reactions to hair at times? Oh yeah. That are, that... It stirs things up. Yeah, when somebody walks by with orange hair, it's still everybody turns around and looks. And some people say something, some don't. But they caught their attention. There was something about it that you know made them think. So. Do you have people from different races, different ethnic backgrounds come in, and are they looking for certain kinds of styles, different styles? Yeah. Um, well, years ago, I took a course specifically to learn how to do to uh, Afro hair, black hair, and uh, it's. Uh, it's quite a different type of hair, so there's quite a bit different, you know, the chemicals that are used and the, the techniques are different. But uh, we only did a, a small amount of that simply because uh, the actual population here that has that type of hair is, is not that large, and there's a couple of people that have already established themselves. So we get people that, that phone and say, you know, can you do cornrows or can you, can, you know, how do you dreadlocks, make dreadlocks yeah. and, and things like that. Although a lot of times they're, they're people that uh, they want to learn how to do it themselves. 
Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the processes would be expensive, and, and there isn't a lot of employment out there for somebody with dreadlocks. And, and do you see crossover? Do you have like kids come in who want dreadlocks who really don't have like oh, af yeah. Afro hair per se? Oh, or? exactly. Yeah, that particular look is sort of like a Jamaican Rastafarian thing, which of course is kind of hip and cool. So you, yeah. know, you, you get you know Scandinavian kids that come in and they <laughs> they want their fine blonde hair made into dreadlocks, which basically just makes it look like really messy fine blonde hair. <laughs> But that's sort of what they want. They're what do you do when you have a customer who comes in and wants something done like that and you know it's not really going to kind of work out the way that they want it to? Well, I usually, you know, warn them about it and I always tell them, you know, whether I think it's a good idea or not, but I always tell them, you know, it's still up to them, it's their hair. Because I know a lot of times if I don't give them what they want or at least tell them, you know, what will happen, then they'll just go ask somebody else and keep going until they get what they want. So I warn them, you know, like, like this is going to trash your hair, you might have to cut these out later, etc. And then, you know, you still want to do it. I imagine it's the same as with, you know, a piercing or a tattoo or something like sure. that. <laughs> okay, well, the question that everybody has to ask a hairdresser, do blondes have more fun? <laughs> well, I've been blonde all my life, and I've had lots of fun, so. <laughs> I mean, we have a black hair guy over here <laughs> that, that just went blonde. We have a witness here. <laughs> and he claims he's had more fun since. Matter of fact, he couldn't get blonde enough. It took him three days to get that blonde. Oh, wow. <laughs> but I think blondes draw more attention. I think maybe that's, that's part of it. You have a theory on why? Is it because I'm, of the movies and the I'm not sure. cultural I, thing? I, I heard a, a story years ago that was a good one, whether it's true or not, about uh, uh, why gentlemen prefer blondes. And it goes way back to like the, the Greek days. First of all, at that time, you know, in, in Greece and Rome, blondes were in the minority because you know, it's a Mediterranean area and the, you know, most people have darker hair. And the other thing is blonde hair is the finest type of hair, which means that the, the actual hair follicle, the little you know, the pore that it grows out of is smaller, which meant at that time, and, and probably, you know, well, still, blondes tended to sweat less. And at that time, you know, people mm. couldn't take a shower every day. So so there's a theory that maybe blondes smelled Smelt better, sweeter. you know, 500 years ago or something. <laughs> that, that could have had funny. something to do with it. <laughs> and, so of course, the blonde, the, the girls of the gentlemen preferred probably did have more fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're kind of in the, in the business of making images. But you're also in a business of, of pleasing customers. Mm -hmm. So let's flip this around a little bit. What what do you concern yourself with when a customer comes in the door? And what kind of image do you want to present to the customer? You mentioned that you kind of warn them if they have ideas that might not quite work out the way that the picture that they brought in said. But are there other things that you have to do in dealing with customers, keep your business going? Um, yeah, of course. From the business point of view, your first concern is that the customer will be happy enough when they leave that they'll come back. Mm -hmm. Because you always want you know long-term customers. And of course you do that by keeping them happy. Mm -hmm. If you've been doing someone's hair for a while and you have an off day and their haircut's not as good as last time, they might get let get away with that once. <laughs> but probably not twice, <laughs> they'll go look for somebody else. So that's probably the, you know, the first concern, at least the second concern, which of course is keeping them happy. And uh, also that they're trying to present an image too. A lot of times somebody's got a job interview, you know, the first thing they do is they look in the mirror and go, you know, my hair is a little long. It doesn't change the person at all. But they, when they walk in for that interview, they want to present the image that there's somebody who gets up in the morning and takes care of themselves and basically, you know, isn't sloppy, which is more likely to get you a job. Yeah. What about things like, I, I remember speaking with some nurses when I did interviewing when I was working my dissertation. One of the nurses I talked to had been a hairdresser for the first 20 years of her life, and she went back and became a nurse. And she was comparing for me the two jobs and that there was some similarities that there were some things that hairdressers had to do that were very similar to nurses one of them was that you touch pe people's bodies yeah. that you you know you're going to be touching their hair and crimping on them and so forth and another is that you have to have like good listening skills do you agree with her is that yeah um, now generally when somebody comes in here of course they're not in pain or anything like that so yeah so a nurse's job in that sense is probably a little more serious you know somebody, <laughs> somebody says I don't feel too good you got to be able to get a little more specific and, and get out from them, you know, what what is the real problem. But it's similar in the sense that if somebody comes in and says, you know, my hair doesn't look right, well, you got to know what it is. And so you talk to them, the same sort of things the nurse would do, I guess. Mm -hmm. Say, so what is it? Is it too long? Is it the wrong color? You know, did somebody else tell you they didn't like it? Or, you know, yeah. is, is it the image you're giving out? Or is there something that you look in the mirror and see that you don't like? People let their hairdresser, like I say, get closer to them than, than the average, you know, stranger. And same as a nurse, you know, you, you mm -hmm. trust a nurse to give you a needle, you would never let anybody else walk up and poke you as one. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And the same sort of thing with the hairdresser. Do people tell their hairdressers things? Is there something going on in the customer hairdresser relationship beyond just the hair, where they sort of? Oh yeah, yeah. I, I heard one theory that it's the psychoanalysis thing that you've laid them back to wash their hair, and now they're back on their back the way you do on the couch, and now all of a sudden they're going to pour their heart out to you. Does that happen to yeah. you? Yeah, I, I call it the bartender syndrome. <laughs> you know, if you sit down at a bar. The guy across the bar brings you a drink. Well, already you're closer to that guy. You have more of a connection than the person sitting next to you. So, you know, you'll, you'll tell him if something's bothering you and things like that. And it's the same thing with people around their hairdresser. They relax a little bit. And, and uh, you know, I've heard lots of things that I didn't really want to hear about. <laughs> you know, you keep nodding your head and smiling. And <laughs> but, yeah, yeah def people definitely, I think, feel more comfortable like, pouring things out than they do with a, with a stranger. And uh, you see your job, your role in this is to just listen and smile. Uh, yeah, I think, I think just listening. I think, uh, you know, you get lots of times when the, the conversation in the whole shop, actually, not just between me and my customer, might turn into, you know, a certain political, you know, feelings towards a politician or something like that. And you got to sort of bite your tongue because if there's five or six people in the shop, you know. <laughs> They're not all going to agree. That's right. <laughs> And you might have that day when they all disagree, you know, scowl at you and things. And, uh, you know, same thing, you know, people will, you know, customers that have been here a few times might ask for a donation to their church or something like that. So you have to be pretty diplomatic and things like that. Do you get communal feeling going sometimes when there are a lot of people in the, in the shop, a lot of people talking to each other? Oh, yeah. They may know each other, that kind of thing. Do you consider this at times kind of the center of the community? Oh, yeah, yeah. You get lots of people that say, uh, you know, some of the older people, this is sort of a social event, you know, they, they play bridge, they get their hair done, and, you know, these are the two or three things that they do every week, no matter what. You know, on a busy day, there's, you know, three or four people at a time getting their hair done, and, you know, they'll talk to each other, or, or they'll join into other conversations, you know, somebody hears something from down the shop, and they have something to add. <laughs> Also, sometimes, you know, the conversation going on next year might be more interested than the one you have. So. <laughs> so you think you'll be doing this for a long time to come? I think so. It, it took a little while for the shop to sort of get rolling, but now it's doing well and the whole area is getting busier all the time. So. Well, I appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Ever since Shakespeare had Polonius utter the words, quote, to thine own self be true, close quote, Westerners have held the idea of being oneself or being one's true self as a moral imperative. Yet most of us present a multitude of selves to other people depending upon the circumstances in which we find ourselves. Irving Goffman opens his book, The Presentation of Self in Everyday Life, with a quote from George Santayana. Quote, Masks are arrested expressions and admirable echoes of feeling, at once faithful, discreet, and superlative. Living things in contact with the air must acquire a cuticle, and it is not urged against cuticles that they are not hearts. Yet some philosophers seem to be angry with images for not being things and with words for not being feelings. Close quote. Goffman makes the case that all of us insulate our inner selves by presenting a cuticle, an outer layer to the world. In the movie The Associate, Whoopi Goldberg plays Laurel Ayers, an African-American investment manager who has moved up rapidly in a Wall Street firm only to whack right into the glass ceiling. She becomes aware of the ceiling when her protege Frank is promoted to vice president and becomes her boss. Being resourceful and otherwise good at what she does, she quits the firm and opens her own investment company. She finds the old boy network to be just as intractable under her new circumstances. She is about to lose her inheritance when she acquiesces to the social pressure and invents an alter ego, an older white male named Robert Cuddy. By presenting her ideas as if they came from her partner Cuddy, she manages for a while to keep the firm afloat while making cutting mysterious and elusive. But again, she acquiesces to pressure, this time in the form of an SEC inquiry, and becomes cutty in the flesh, and must maintain the facade 
by passing as a white male. On the surface, this is the theater of the absurd, a farce that digs deeper and deeper into a hole that everyone knows she cannot help but fall through. But the movie relies upon a long history of racism and sexism and an intricate understanding of the social construction of each. Skin color is often presented as being in distinct categories, with clear delineations of who is, quote, black, close quote, and who is, quote, white, close quote. However, skin comes in a wide variety of shades along a continuum of dark to light, and who gets designed as black or white is dependent upon social construction more than actual skin color. Russell, Wilson, and Hall point out in their book, The Color Complex, The Politics of Skin Color Among African Americans, that many of the black leaders from the 19th and 20th centuries were light-skinned. Examining W. E. B. Du Bois's, quote, talented tenth, close quote, they found that most of the names on the list were of mixed heritage, many of them being able to pass for white. Sociologist F. James Davis, in his book, Who is Black?, examines the implications of the, quote, one drop of blood, close quote, construction of Negro heritage, which remained a standard in many states on birth certificates well into the 20th century. Walter White, president of the NAACP from 1931 to 1955, was only 164th African heritage by bloodline, but he and his family claimed their African heritage above other cultural heritages, and he fought for civil rights for blacks and was part of the black community, even though it would have been easy for him and his family to pass as white. The only time Walter White did pass for white was when he investigated lynching practices by observing them firsthand. Lawrence Otis Graham's daring book, Our Kind of People, reveals the long history of division amongst African Americans based upon lightness of skin and its corollary wealth. Light-skinned African Americans have found it easier to amass wealth in racist America, where darkness of skin guarantees proportional stigmatization. After examining extensively the black upper class, he turns in the last chapter to the question of passing into white society. In that chapter, he lists 17 tips for passing, based upon an Atlanta attorney's description of a number of relatives who had passed. Passing is a complete change of identity, which includes divorcing oneself from family, history, and community. Quote, Think of some manner in which to kill yourself off in the minds of black people you know and your family. If your parents or siblings are willing participants in assisting you, they can say that you now live outside the country, that you have entered a cult or religious order, or even that you have died. Realize that blacks, and not whites, are the ones who can threaten your security as a black person living a lie. Avoid any meaningful interaction with black people. Close quote. Gender is equally socially constructed, relying often on dress, hair, and makeup as cues to who is female and who is male. Cross-dressing and other cross-gendered practices crack open the dichotomous assumptions of male-slash-female identities. The presence in the movie of a drag queen underscores the social construction of gender. The movie doesn't back off from the intersection of these socially designated identities. At one point, the main character and her white executive assistant trade notes on who has benefited from affirmative action efforts, with the African-American woman announcing to the white woman, quote, affirmative action wasn't supposed to help you, close quote. Goffman speaks of discrepant roles. These are role conflicts that arise from a presentation of self that is not wholly authentic. Part of managing our identities, our multiple selves, involves keeping secrets. These secrets can be kept among a tight, trusted social circle, but no one else. Some of these secrets can be revealed without breaking the illusion of the presented self, but others will undermine the presentation and ruin the presented identity. Goffman suggests that these secrets are kept in a physical space as well as a social space, a kind of backstage where some players are allowed to see how the illusion is made, but where the audience is forbidden. Laurel has to keep the secret of Robert Cuddy, at first to herself and then among two chosen friends, 
who help her keep the impression going. Her executive assistant, Sally, and a drag queen, Charlie, who lives in her apartment building and helps her with expert practical intervention addressing the nuances of passing. The character Sally fits Goffman's discussion of backstage front stage presentations perfectly. Goffman suggests that within businesses there are keepers of the portal to the backstage, and Sally does this job well even before she is fully aware of the magnitude of Laurel's backstage area. Robert Cuddy doesn't exist. No, you don't understand. I made him up. He, he's not real. Oh, I've known that for weeks. What do you mean you've known that for weeks? What, what do you mean you've known for yeah, weeks? Well, sure. I mean, because every idea Cuddy had, it, it was already in your files or I saw you come up with it. Why didn't you say anything if you knew? What? And stop getting all those great presents? Oh, Lance, I mean, I loved it. If you had to make up a white male in order for people to get to recognize your talent, then I thought, well, it's my job to, you know, keep the illusion going and support you. <laughs> I cannot believe that you knew and didn't yeah, say Yeah, 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 sure. You are something else. Oh. Charlie is invited by degrees to the backstage area. Laurel first turns to him to help her present Laurel to Wall Street bigwigs at a cocktail party. So, girlfriend, what look are we going for this time? I don't know, Charlie. It's such a big night, you know. All these bigwigs from Wall Street will be there. Well, the slut look never fails. I know, but I have to look intelligent. After all, I'm representing Robert Cuddy. Slutty. Get intelligent. News anchor. Later, when Cuddy must be created in the flesh, the drag queen becomes a natural confidant because he has already participated in some image management and because of his first-hand expertise in passing. Passing requires not only the backstage area but technological knowledge and expertise to create the physicality of the identity. At first, this was only a matter of creating an electronic identity over the web and an office identity through the decor of the space called Cuddy's office. Laurel sets up banking accounts, emails, and identification cards in Cuddy's name. She purchases masculine items such as leather chairs, mahogany wood, a box of cigars, and a rhino head to decorate the office. But as Cuddy must be made flesh, she turns to makeup, clothing, gloves, and so forth to create the illusion. In other words, she needed materials. The social construction was accompanied by a number of physical symbols that relied upon cultural understandings such as men hunt and men smoke cigars. She was managing symbols and resources to manage the impression of Cuddy. You're listening to First Person Plural on CFUV, Victoria's Public Radio, 101.9 FM, 104.3 cable and on the internet cfub.uvig.ca giving sociology an edge <laughs> Okay, what is it this time? Well, I need kind of a new look. Well, honey, it's what I live for. I hope so. It's got to be distinguished, rich, powerful, old, and male. Well, now it's getting interesting. White. White? Yeah, he's got to be white. Oh, shit. I told you this was crazy. You got a better idea? I don't think it's crazy. Charlie can work miracles. Well, honey, I could sure use a miracle right now. Yeah. Hello, my name is Robert Cuddy. Lower your voice. Just just a few octaves. Oh. Uh, hello, my name is Robert Cuddy. Deeper. My name is Robert Cuddy. And I'm deeper. deeper. If I go any deeper, I'll be talking out of my uterus. Throw a little male attitude in there. Oh my God. <laughs> All right. Uh... That's me, uh, Bob Cuddy, and I'm just gonna take you and bite your booty in the back of my truck. I said male, not moron. <laughs> Done. Is this gonna fool the SEC? Well, it's a miracle. 
There were, perhaps, alternatives to creating Robert Cuddy. Laurel is an African American. She is a Catholic. She is a woman. All of these social roles are group memberships with potential resources upon which Laurel could have drawn. The movie does not address this aspect of her social world at all, though it does come close when Laurel first looks for a bank loan to start her firm. Do you have any assets? Well, yeah, I have drive and courage and ambition, and if you look at the prospectus, you'll notice that I have a very, very sound business mind, too. I was thinking more like stocks, bonds, property. Ah. Now we're starting to sound a little like a men's bank now, aren't we? Oh, I see. Because we're the women's bank, we should go against standard banking practices and give you this very large, unsecured loan because you're the right gender. Well... You know, it might send a message. Right. But women don't know how to run a bank. Touché. With one word, touché, Laurel dismisses the possibility of delegitimizing the Wall Street financial world paradigm. A woman's bank, which prioritizes banking practices over women's solidarity, is nothing more than a bank with women playing the patriarchal roles. The movie could have done much more with this aspect of the glass ceiling, but it didn't. There is a suggestion through the ways in which the men do business, at strip joints, at exclusive male clubs, on golf courses, and at fancy restaurants, that the women are left out of the loop by being excluded from backstage places where communication takes place. The strategies to cope with this disadvantage do not rely upon solidarity, however. Instead, one woman announces that, quote, men like doing business with men, but they want to sleep with us, and that's our power, close quote. Early in the movie, Laurel and a, another businesswoman from another firm find themselves uncomfortably watching strippers with their male associates. Instead of finding common ground in their distaste for doing business, in such an atmosphere, they discuss breast enhancements as a method of getting ahead on Wall Street. The other woman advises Laurel, quote, Next time you are at a really important business meeting, try showing some cleavage. See what a difference a chest makes, close quote. The movie also does very little in the way of showing any possibility of solidarity between Laurel and any other African Americans. They are non-existent in the movie, except for the service personnel at the Peabody Club. She does nothing to seek them out. She wants to work in the white world, and she is fully aware that she will need to hang out with white people in order to do that. The fact that Laurel is African American, however, does dominate her character and the storyline. She lives in an apartment building she inherited from her father. The people living in her building are not Wall Street types, but struggling working people who may or may not pay the rent on time. One pivotal moment in the movie is when she overhears a conversation regarding an inquiry about the takeover of a major corporation because the diner she frequents is the place they pick to meet where no one on Wall Street would overhear the conversation. She is able to look like a genius, or rather have Cuddy look like a genius, because of her knowledge which she acquired by accident. More could have been made of this accident, but it simply remains a plot mechanism. However, it does reveal the inequities between the start that she had in life as a working class African American and those of her white counterparts of the Peabody Club. The scene is believable because she is working class and African American. Thus we are led to believe that the illusion of Robert Cuddy is the only avenue available to Laurel to accomplish her goals. Of course, it would have been an entirely different movie if Laurel had actually challenged the paradigms of Wall Street, implicitly or explicitly, and pushed her work in a different direction than just being the best at the existing game. Inevitably, of course, this illusion breaks down, because Laurel wants recognition of herself by others. Essentially, she is too good at the impression management, and she feels cheated when others do not recognize the woman behind the man. Her proficiency in the backstage leads inevitably to her being upstaged in the particular case by her own creation. To relieve this tension, Sally and Laurel decide to kill off Robert Cuddy, but his identity has taken on a life of its own. In addition, their attempts draw the suspicion of her old protege and nemesis, 
Frank, who guesses that Robert Cuddy is nothing but the product of Laurel's ambition and imagination. He upstages her by resurrecting Cuddy, in the process sparing her having to face murder charges, but diverting Cuddy to his own aims. All of this culminates when the exclusively male, exclusively white Peabody Club names Robert Cuddy its Man of the Year. It becomes the revelatory moment in the movie, consequent to Laurel realizing that coming out, that revealing herself and Cuddy to be one and the same, is the only way to rid herself of Cuddy and of Frank's influence and to be recognized for her true self, although not without costs. Thus, her revelation that Cuddy is indeed Laurel, and Laurel is indeed Cuddy, is more than a confession. It is a political statement, one which she makes eloquently in the form of Cuddy's acceptance speech, in front of the membership of the club and a television audience. She underscores the politics of the exclusively male domain by having Cuddy kiss Frank fully on the mouth in front of the membership. This shocking act not only is the first crack in the Cuddy facade, but it is a blatant statement on the facade the audience is fabricating as well. The Associate is about what an authentic self is and what it is not. Laurel gets to present her ideas and pitch her schemes to investors as a white man, but not as a black woman. She has the acquired roles that her education and financial knowledge afford her through her position in the firm and her subsequent acquisition and management of her own company. But her assigned roles of African American and woman get in the way. Ironically, the creation of an alter ego in the end allows her to get the recognition she craves. By creating the secret, and pulling the wool over the eyes of the members of the Peabody Club, she cracks their secrets as well. They are a homosexual, racist, sexist, old boy network, pretending to be a meritocracy, congratulating each other on their accomplishments. Only by cracking open the illusions was she able to walk out of the situation with her head held high. You're not going to get away with this, watch me. Donald, I see you're still smoking those cheap cigars. It's nice to see you, Robert. And you, Walter, my new partner. No, Frank, don't go anywhere. I like it when you're close. Without you, I wouldn't be here tonight. You know, on one hand, there's something wonderful about being accepted into an exclusive club. It makes a man feel, well, damn good. You didn't know a damn thing about me, but you accepted me as one of your own, which... I find amazing. You let my work speak for itself, and look what's happened. You've made me businessman of the year. But in the words of Groucho Marx, I don't want to be part of a club that would have me as a member. <laughs> you know, gentlemen, there's something about exclusivity. You know the word exclusive means to exclude. And I thought that would be the case with me. So I played by the rules. I worked really hard, I was very, very honest. But I knew that I didn't have the right image to be accepted into this club and that chances were I would never have the right image. Image is a funny thing. Because underneath the right image could be the wrong one. And underneath the wrong image. You may just find a real Robert Cuddy. Possibly the man who's serving you coffee or offering you a cigar. You know, it could be a busboy or a waiter. You just never know. And gentlemen, I want to congratulate you for inducting into the Peapotty Club your first woman member. This, of course, is a Hollywood ending and hardly credible as Laurel has perpetrated a fraud on investors 
and the legal considerations would not have evaporated as painlessly as the ending implied. In addition, the victory is somewhat shallow. It must end, as it does, with the Peabody members applauding her ruse, because she must have their approval in order for Laurel to go on to live happily ever after. She earns their respect, but if one were to think too hard about this respect, one might wonder why she would care to earn the respect of these men. But we are not supposed to think about that. Instead, we are supposed to find the ending emotionally satisfying because we are rooting for the authentic person called Laurel. We want to believe that the roles we choose for ourselves deserve recognition. We hope that like the Emperor's new clothes, racism and sexism will crumble when we render them naked. In the meantime, we continue to handle our roles as best we can, presenting our best selves to each other and feeling the discrepancy between who we feel we really are and who we feel we need to be. Person Plural, your source for soothing sounds of sociological sagaciousness. The police state is using its phallocentric organ, the corporate media, to control ordinary people like you and me. Bringing together the hairdresser and the associate probably isn't as difficult as it sounds. The reason that I thought the two segments went together well is I think that there is a lack of looking at image management as part of impression management. Goffman addresses it a little bit in that quote that I read earlier about the body being the peg upon which we hang certain things in order to impress other people. but there really hasn't been a lot about the physicality, the technology, the business, if you will, the material business of creating an image in order to manage the impressions of others. I was going to ask you about that. You mentioned that Goffman had written about it. Is there a lot of other literature on the subject? There really isn't. There is a, a professor named Rose White who is working on a book, and I think she has been for several years now, and I'm not sure that it's finished, but I hear her talk about it every once in a while um, when I'm at conferences or on listservs, where she's looking at hair, and she's been examining hair sociologically from a number of different angles. I know that she's been looking at the politics of hair, what hair symbolizes and how hair has been used by people to make political statements. I also know that she's looked at it from a very gendered perspective, taking a look at what women do to their hair, how hair kind of controls women's lives and so forth, including things like the removal of hair, which women are always fighting the battle in the society to shave or pluck or whatever. But I don't know that she actually looked at it using Goffman. I'll be interested to see the book when it comes out because I'd be, I, to me, I would think that that's very much a part of what hair is in, um, in sociological terms. I, I know that there are some young scholars who are coming up who have looked at tattooing and body piercing in, in the realm of presentation of self. Um, the idea of, of making certain statements, certain, certain social statements by decorating the body in certain ways. But I don't really know of a lot of people who are looking at this in sociological terms. I think there's been some cultural studies stuff about this. Do you consider market research to be sociology? <laughs> well, I do, but I'm not sure that the marketers do. I think there's a bit of overlap anyway. Yes. And I assure you there's been a bunch of market research done about this. Oh, God, yes. And, and I think that market research is probably one of the more interesting places to get sociological information. The only problem with marketing research is that it's done in order to mess with the market. We'd be hard pressed to say, you know, people use makeup because they want to and the market research has figured out how they want to and provides it. Or people don't really want to use makeup, but the marketers have manipulated us into wanting to use makeup. So it begs the question sometimes when you look at market research, how much influence the research itself has on the end product of the research. 
I remember you were asking during the interview whether there were people who came into the salon wanting nothing but a wash and a cut, the people who thought that washing their hair was upkeep enough. Well, even for those people, there is a huge, shall we say, market. Yeah, it, it ain't just soap. <laughs> well, uh, it is just soap for the most part. But it's perfume soap and soap that makes your hair feel finer or keep more body or detangles. It's soap that... In um, different size containers. Yes, different size containers, prettier smells than others. Uh, some are reputed to create orgasms. <laughs> or implied anyway. Yeah. <laughs> and they are branded, branded, branded. Oh, yeah. And that's just if you use shampoo. Yes. No conditioner, no cream rinse. No leave-in treatment sprays, no hairsprays, no gels, no molding cream. I mean, the list goes on forever, and that's just hair. So at what point do you cease to be the one doing the managing of your image and become the one who is being managed? At what point do you go from subject to object, and is there a path back? I don't think you can ever know. I remember seeing something. There was a television show that ran for some time about 420-somethings living in New York that was immensely popular. And someone was saying that it was unrealistic that somebody of the female character's modest means would have a $100 hairdo. Someone responded to the original correspondent saying that he lived in New York and that he knew of very few women, financial status notwithstanding, who would spend less than $100 on their do. So at what point does one cease to be the one managing the image and become one who is managed via the desire to manage one's image? At what point do you go from subject to object and is there a path back? Who knows? I mean, I can't answer that question. I don't think anybody can to. answer that question. I think that marketing manipulates this to such an extent that even if you think that you're acting from your own desire, you probably aren't. One of the things that I do want to stress, though, is what Goffman is talking about in this, and that is that all of this stuff is made up in the back region. You know, we think that we're back here creating this image ourselves and presenting it out in the world. But what Goffman is say, suggesting is that this is in fact a social arrangement and it includes a team of people. And so back regions like hair salons are, or your bathroom. Hold it. Is the salon backstage? Yes. Or front stage? It's backstage, I think, in Goffman's ideas. Is that there is some front stage part to it. but. I think that when he talks about making an impression, it's okay to walk in the salon looking like a dog and walk out looking great. Not that I don't know women who don't fix their hair before they go to the salon. They do exist. But for the most part, it's meant to be a backstage area. It's the technology of the backstage. There's a social context to this backstage just the way there is a social context to the front stage. The props that you take to the front stage the image that you put together for the front stage is done with a group, with a team of people, some of them more confidant than others. You know, I talked to David about the fact that people give their hairdressers all sorts of information that they don't normally give strangers, that they talk about their emotional lives. And I think one of the reasons why they let their hair down, sorry for the pun, when they're at the hairdresser is because it is a backstage region. You've let somebody in on the secret that your hair is not naturally curly, that it isn't naturally blonde, that it isn't... That it isn't your hair at all. And now that you've let them in on that secret, you can let them in on some other secrets too. That they are part of your backstage team. The cat is out of the bag, yes. Yes, yes. Getting back to more formal approaches to image management, is image management something that is localized very. And to what degree? Yeah, this is exactly what Goffman is getting at, is that impressions are managed on the basis of anticipating what the audience will think of you. If you're going to a job interview, you anticipate what the prospective employer thinks of you. If you're going to work, you anticipate what the boss and what your fellow workers are expecting of you. What Goffman is saying is, People don't have perfect information socially. They are guessing. Impression management is about guessing correctly what other people will think. 
It's about evoking a response in your audience, guessing what you need to do to evoke that response. And so that's why he talks about credited and discredited impression management. Accredited impression management is one that the audience gets what you're trying to do. The discredited impression management is when you've attempted something that the audience doesn't get. A friend of mine, Laurel Tripp, went to raves and did sociological research in raves. She went in and watched the way that old time ravers who had been there long before it was hip to go to a rave treated the newcomers. And it was pretty easy to spot the newcomers because the old timers showed up in baggy clothes that would let you sweat because you came there to dance. That was the whole purpose of being at the rave was to hear the really, really fast music and dance to that music. And the new timers came dressed up in club wear with high heels and short skirts. Or the men came dressed up in nice shoes. They came in order to be looked at. And that was not the thing that a raver was supposed to do. A raver was supposed to come looking like they're comfortable so that they could go ahead and dance. The people who showed up looking kind of like they were going to a disco were discredited. They had guessed wrong. They had heard what a rave was and it assumed it was something like a disco. And they had the wrong information and they showed up and when they showed up they were labeled as outside. Their performance was discredited by the people who were there. And this level of impression management can get very, very specific in certain cultures. One of the things that hung up punk in the mid-80s was the appearance of the trendies. There were people who would show up wearing the clothes and the hardcore, the punks who had supposedly been there all along, although what all along meant one is never sure, lost their minds because on one hand they wanted to be iconoclasts very badly. They didn't want you to think that they cared what you thought of them, but at the same time they were confronted by this other, by the gaze of the other as it were, and inescapably they found their way into existential hell. How does a matter of principle does one dress when one simultaneously wants to be differentiated from the inauthentic mirrors of oneself and at the same time to convey with perfect sincerity that one does not care about the generalized other. Yep. Right away they're on the horns of a dilemma. How do I dress to look like I don't care like how I dress? Yeah. Which is an amazing conundrum when you think about it. Uh -huh. I remember John Lydon saying that he'd met Sid in art school, that nobody at the art school would talk to John, nobody at the art school would talk to Sid, and they didn't exactly like each other either, but nobody else would hang out with them, so they wound up hanging a lot. The thing about the iconoclast position is that sometimes it works. Sometimes people believe you are sincere about simply not giving a darn, and they leave you alone. One runs the risk of being a well-understood intellectual, as opposed to the misunderstood variety. So punkers uh, basically didn't get along with each other at all. <laughs> well, they couldn't seem to make up their minds. That was one more bit of iconoclasm. They weren't earth muffins, they didn't hug a lot. <laughs> Yeah, you know, well, all those spikes and everything, it would be kind of dangerous bashing, to uh, hug each other. Bashing foreheads into each other doesn't count either. But yeah, they resisted that as well. They sure. really were nihilists, when you, or trying to be nihilists anyway. They aspire to be nihilists. It's an interesting thought because it shows when, when people talk about image management and look at image management, the first thing that comes to mind is always business, is always this kind of faking, you know, we're doing an image management here, and what we, we want you to believe is that we're good, decent citizens, and that we're that we never screw up, and that we, like David said, that we take care of ourselves and all. But the truth is, even the people who are trying to get across, I don't take care of myself, and I don't give a damn, is still having to manage that image. That it's not a prescriptive time, formula. How yeah. do you dress when you don't care how people think about you? You still have to choose to purchase the physical piece of clothing and you still have to choose which among your physical pieces of clothing to put on today. There is still this physical reality. And yeah, for some reason, nihilists don't tend to be nudists. If there's a, <laughs> a phenotype to it, it's black on black with a swatch of black. Which is still a statement, which is still an impression that's being managed.
You have been listening to First Person Plural, because how people get along with each other still matters. First Person Plural is a show created for community radio by Carl Wilkerson and Dr. Patty Thomas to examine social and organizational issues. Music for First Person Plural is performed, composed, and produced by Carl Wilkerson, except where noted. For more information about First Person Plural, Dr. Patty Thomas, or Carl Wilkerson, Visit our website, www.culturalconstructioncompany.com, or email us at fpp at culturalconstructioncompany.com.